Hello, everybody, and thanks for joining me for another week of the Rec Poker Podcast Forums Edition. You know it's the Forums Edition because you're hearing my voice. I'm Jim Reed, Bluff Serini in the home games, uh, and you can hear about me and everyone else on the Rec and Crew by going to rec.poker slash crew. I'd like to thank Website Amp and the Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino for putting this little group of wizards together. Some of my favorite poker people in the whole world right here. Uh, poker Wizards, why don't you share a little bit about your with Rec Poker Nation. I'm Chris Jones. You can find me 5x5 five five on Poker Stars and Twitter. And I'm John Somsky. I'm Poker Geek MN everywhere. And I'm Kim Kilroy. I'm Fergie56 in the home game on Poker Stars and Pat Bat everywhere else. And uh, just like every week, because I've got the best job in the world, while we're duking it out in the Rec Poker nightly home game, uh, we get to take a question from the forums at rec.poker. And this post that we're looking at today is actually by 5x5 five five himself, the one and only Chris Jones, talking about uh, stone bubble ranging and decision. So uh, Chris, why don't I, this is something that I think a lot of people should have thought about before the bubble comes. And I know you have, uh, but sh- this is the kind of real life example that comes up that you don't want to be thinking about for the first time on the felt. So can you just describe the situation here and what made it interesting to you? Sure. Uh, so there are 37, I mean, a, a $33 ACR tournament. Uh, I believe there's like $1,600, $1,800, maybe $2,000 for, to the winner. So it's it's a smaller tournament, but it's still, you know, we're, we're, we're approaching so the money here. There's 37 people left 36 of which get paid and we are third overall in chips so we're three of 37 uh we've got about 80 big blinds uh and we cover everybody at the table um so we're the chip leader at our table um and um it well uh, should i tell you what i had or should we have the conversation first let's have the conversation first okay let's okay so it folds to us in the cutoff and we open with a mystery hand um to 2.2 big blinds uh and it folds then to the small blind who has 41 big blinds behind reminder we have 79 big blinds behind and they shove all 41 big blinds into the middle it folds back to us so uh we are not threatened our tournament life is not threatened by this uh small blinds obviously is uh if we call and lose we're going to be middle of the pack uh, if we call and win, we're the uh, bar none mega chip leader of this whole tournament. And if we fold, we've only lost two big blinds. We're still third in chips. Um, we And we know a little bit about this villain. Uh, we've played with them a decent amount, uh, 170 hands. Uh, they're not a wild player. At least their stats would not suggest that. Uh, they're a 17 VPIP uh, with a 10 PFR and only a 6-3 bet. So they're they're not on the like, um, you know, go crazy type of player. Uh, we'd like a little bit more sample to make, you know, like real determination here, but, but 170 hands is a, is a pretty decent number. So, so I guess, uh, before I tell you what I had, I guess part of my question is what do we think small blind is doing this with? Uh, and is this even regardless of what small blind has, and regardless of what we think of what small blind has, is this, is this a, I mean, is this possibly, is this a correct play to shove 41 big blinds from the small blind into the table chip leader? So a couple, a couple of thoughts that I had just looking at your um, post here, just right off, because we're in an ICM situation, you're, the, the thing you do, the, I absolutely love the way you're just framing the conversation, which is what happens if we call and win? What happens if we call and lose? What happens if we just fold here? Because ultimately, that's what we really need to be thinking about. Like, what is our tournament position going to be in these various cases? And how important is it? And how sure do we feel about it? And then when we get to look at the range, we can kind of already kind of have that framework in mind. And I think, you know, 170 hands is enough to get the kind of pre-flop stats that we're going to be dealing with here. So I think you should feel pretty comfortable with that. 
um, sample size. And when, when they come up as a, a 17, 10, six, you know, that's a real value heavy player who knows how to balance a three bet, but it still feels like it's not going to be an exploitatively wide range in any place. And if anything, likely the other, and, and particularly um, in this kind of a spot, I don't think they're going to be reaching for a lot of those ace five suited um, bluff shoves here. Uh, so it does feel like a pretty value heavy range, which, uh, which I think they should be doing if they have a range of hands that they're going to be shoving 40 big blinds over your open here. I can't imagine that's always going to be the right play in position. Out of position, I'm a little more open-minded to it, but it still seems like they're putting a lot of extra chips at risk there. What, what does the rest of the panel think? Uh, I think that the uh, overbet shove here is very common and this, these sort of things with hands that don't want to don't want to call like they don't still want to play a pot post flop so eights nines tens jacks um i i don't think they'd be doing this with aces kings maybe queens i'm not sure ace king people will often do this with ace king offsuit ace king suited they'll just because they want to see all five cards if they get called um they might do it with ace queen is that is that on the bubble as well, Kim? You're talking about because like, I, I, I feel that, like some players are just going to fold pocket eights. Here. I I agree and I disagree because in when you're in the bubble of an online tournament, it's different than mm. when you're in the live tournament on the bubble. In my opinion, like they're not necessary. They're not always just looking at the bottom line. I think they have value here. And I think they have value that doesn't want to get, if they raise, they don't want to get shoved on. So their, their, val so their value probably isn't aces, kings anyway, but they could definitely have queens, jacks, tens, ace, king, ace, queen kind of hands. Maybe down to, maybe down to nines, maybe not eights. I mean, that's borderline, but it is cut off open. So I think this is not a mm, bad shove mm, with mm. with uh, middle to premium to good pocket pair, but not a premium pocket pair. Not like aces or kings. Yeah, it, I don't know. From my point of view, I'm not. This may be a play that is made commonly, but shoving that big just doesn't seem like it's a good idea you know unless you're doing it with like aces or kings um because you're just risking too much you're going to sh chase away um and the only reason to do it with aces or kings is because then if you're called at least you're in a really good spot and you could become the tournament chip leader from here uh and you're if you have aces obviously you're guaranteed to be at worst um, and even flip against the other set of aces. Um, but I, I, that just seems too big of a raise to be uh, reasonable. Yeah, this player's stack makes me feel that this is type of play, this player's stats that Chris has makes me feel this isn't the type of player that's ever going to do this with aces or kings. They're just going to play do a more reasonable raise and like play it for value here. Um, and when we're in a $33 tournament, like the bottom payout is not that much. We're really just going for top three in this sort of event. That's true. And, uh, but I will say, I think that there are players, players who are, like, I, I read these stats a little differently, uh, but I could be reading them wrong. But when I see a player who has sort of tighter stats wake up like this. I think that tighter players, I think, I think about their motivations and their rationale. And these are players who don't like risk as much. They don't like seeing all their chips in the middle. So I, I definitely considered aces or Kings as part of this. They think I'm on the bubble. If we're gonna, if this is going to be a bad hand for me, I want to get it in good. Um, I think we can see, with a tight player, aces or kings in this kind of spot, at least. Uh, but I could be wrong. 
Yeah, I, I feel like I, I, this is a great question for this group because um, I think different players will think about this spot differently. Personally, I feel like the, the kind of player that plays a 17-10-6 is going to tighten up on the bubble. And I, I, I feel like it, I'm, I'm reading this as, as a super premium hand because I think a lot of other people might have that wider range there um but i just i just for some reason that this one feels this one this this player feels like they're just not going to be putting those chips in bad and and they're the kind of player who thinks that it's bad to get it in with like ace jack suited there or pocket tens or um something like that the if i was playing this in time i would feel this player had ace king mm -hmm. like i just feel feel yeah. that like i mean i would yeah, like yeah, to yeah. see a raise to let you shove with mm -hmm. something worse if this player had aces or kings. Right. But ace king is never, it's an unmade hand. And it just seems like the type of hand that a lot of players online will shove an over shove with pre flop. It, it definitely is. And I see, I see ace king all the time in spots that aren't like the stone bubble where somebody will shove, you know, 40, 50, 60 big blinds. I had somebody, I had somebody shove like 120 big blinds into my aces uh, yesterday, and uh, I lost. But, oh. uh, I saw you rubbing your. But um, <laughs> you know, like I think people with ace king just are like, let's let's put you to the test. Let's get it in the middle. Um, but let's just let's just let's well two two questions about that. I think once we get to the bubble, there is that factor that I you know it's hard to know which players are taking it seriously. I think you actually can determine that more in a live setting than you can online. Uh, but I, so the only thing I can lean on is really stats. But then the other thing that um, if this player flipped over ace king, you know, just showed nice. us the cards, like we're what 54. Well, it depends if it's suited or not, but we're like a between a 52 and 54% favorite. Well, I haven't told you what I had, but uh, I have pocket queens. Um, <laughs> so um, we're, we're, we're a favorite. It's plus EV. High five the dealer, get it in. Get it in? <laughs> yeah. Like, I mean, as a mega chip stack leader in this kind of a tournament, you have a really good chance to make the final three. But, and if you lose the race, then you can still grind it back up. You're still like a medium stack, like you can still grind it back up. So, but you have a chance here being slightly ahead to be the overall whelming chip leader and to uh, have a chance of making the final three, which is yeah. where all the payouts are. This is something that came up in a uh, Learn Pro Poker study group that I just did last week, where it was these two. So, one of my question for you, Chris, uh, is did you feel like you had a skill edge in this tournament or not? Because if you, there's, there's this ICM versus uh, FGS uh, tension where if we feel like we have a skill edge, maybe we should actually be kind of turning down some of these unknown spots where we think it might just be a coin flip for, for a huge stack because we have other ways to win it later. Whereas the, there's also this notion of the future game simulation, which is, yeah, but if you've got a skill edge, man, having the biggest stack by a mile, you can do a lot of damage with that. So how, how do you think about that kind of stuff? Well, the thing I, so ultimately I did fold and I, mm. and I'll tell you what I'm thinking here is we are still on the bubble. I am yeah. still the chip leader at this table. And that has a tremendous amount of value. Mm. And I am, uh, I am much, I would much rather have be on the bubble and be able to punish the rest of the players at my table. I, I love, there's nothing better in poker, <laughs> right? Than being a chip leader at a table when yeah. you're on a bubble. Yeah, it's you just, don't want the bubble to burst. I, it's this is the, the best. best situation. Yeah. And so, I, yes, I could have uh, 120 big blinds rather than 80 and, and, but, but 50 or 46 to 40, well, who knows, right? I don't know what this player had, but you know, it's possible I had some 80, 20 in there. It's possible they're doing this with Jackson tens. I just really, I really kind of narrowed this down to ace king and maybe some kings and aces. 
And I, I was like, well, I'm either behind or I'm flipping. And I, 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 I didn't want to take a flip for this amount. I felt like I, I liked the position I had at the table and I passed it up. But I, you know, I'm not saying that's correct. I was going to ask you that question about whether or not you felt like you could uh, abuse the bubble. But then there's you're sitting with four tables and you're on the stone bubble, um, which means you're not going to have a lot of time to do this. So even if you fold, you may not be get, giving yourself much time was my thought process. So I was thinking that discounts the importance of that particular element. If there were still like three people left to the be uh, bubble, then I think it would be more value because you'd have more time to exert that pressure. But, um, and to me, not analyzing the situation, but just from a gut feel, Queens is kind of right at the point, the tipping point of whether or not I call or, or fold. Uh, for me, jacks would be a fairly easy fold. Kings are a relatively easy call. And Queens, I hate life. <laughs> um, <laughs> so... Uh, you know, I, I, I don't think I could argue with either decision, but um, I wouldn't count the abusing the bubble as much with that large of a player pool and only one seat left to the bubble. Yeah, that's, that's a, a great point. point. Let, let's see what our friend John Little has to say, and then I'll come back and talk about this a little longer. Have you ever wondered whether you should call a preflop raise or three bet instead? What do you do when you have a flush draw? Do you raise it or do you just call? What about ace king? What do you do with ace king when you oh, miss good. the flop? Are you tired of guessing about what the right play is with your particular hand? Well, my name is Jonathan Little, and I am a two-time World Poker Tour champion and creator of PokerCoaching.com, where we offer over a thousand interactive hand quizzes where you play a hand and then get real-time feedback from our world-class pros. Don't guess and don't stress. Just register for your free account at PokerCoaching.com slash RecPoker right now. That's right, pokercoaching.com slash rec poker. And Jonathan will give you a money back guarantee if you don't find the material he's putting out there helpful. He'll give you your money back. Go tell him rec poker sent you. So this is a this is, this is such a tricky spot. I, I'm still coming around to I'd need I'd need to feel like I knew something about this small bind player to think they were getting out of line just enough to make this worth it because ultimately like with so many of these questions in poker it comes down to what is the range that we put on this player because that's going to answer this question for us if we're serious um and Stu in the chat here stewy 13 says uh i was thinking only top three hands would take that action and that's that's i i kind of feel like that as well um in the chat in the forum um rob puts in he puts the small blind on tens plus and ace queen plus uh which we're not doing that badly against um and it's another one of those spots where it's like do you embrace it or or, or not chris yeah i know if i if i knew that was the range then i think this has got to be a snap call at that point mm -hmm. um but if you if you tighten them up any, then it starts to get a little more dubious. Great, great question from Kim here too. I, I joke about this all the time. So aces and kings are definitely the best two hands. Um, and then what is what is the third best hand? And, and how do you <laughs> sort of go down from there, right? Kim, do you have a take? Aces, kings, queens, then yeah. ace, king. Yeah. Ace, king suited. I, I, I mean... Ace, kings, queens are top three hands. I think they're shoving more than top three hands here. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I think they can shove jacks and tens here. Like how people don't know how to play jacks. And like you're cut off open. Like they mm -hmm. can make you. Like yeah. that's what they're supposed to do here. With that hand. That's a good point. I keep thinking, for whatever reason, I keep putting Chris in early position here with this. I don't know why I'm doing that in my mind. I think it's because it's the bubble play, and I feel like everyone's tight, so this person should be like feeling like it's a tight range, but it's, it's not really. You're right. They are in the cutoff. And plus, if he's been raising a lot and abusing the table a lot, people and Chris are going to start has. to take a stand. They're going to start to take a stand with a lot. 
That's a great point, Kim. Why Chris, were you being were you being your typical five by five self and being a jerk uh, getting I mean, out of line we, of the table? We, we, probably a little. Because <laughs> Kim's bringing me around now because I haven't been considering your table image. If this guy's got 170 hands on you and you're opening from late position, you know, that, uh, I mean, I'm not a 1710, so I can't, it's hard for me to get into the head of a 1710, but um, I mean, yeah, I'd, I'd want to find a couple extra combos to get in there. That's a great point, Kim. I wasn't thinking about that position or, or Chris's own table image. Mm -hmm. So I'm guessing Chris, he did not flip over and show you the Kings. Nope. Nope. No, and I did. I, I made. I it, I took my whole time bank down. Yeah. Um, which was very. Everyone's very happy with me because we're hand for hand. Oh so right. I'm holding <laughs> up the whole tournament, uh, making up my decision here. Um, but I did ultimately fold because uh, mm. I decided. Ultimately, I told myself, I like being the table chip leader a lot better than I like being the table chip leader by even more. Yeah. So. Yeah, I, but I, 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 I can't really defend it. I, Kim, I think you're right about a lot of the thing. I, um, I, I thought at the time this is probably a mistake, but I'm going to fold anyway. Um, but I'm, I, yeah. So. And is it a bigger mistake to fold improperly or to call improperly? I guess that's the question too. You know, it's like, what kind of mistake do I want to be complaining about later? Um, why are you calling improperly? You're calling versus a range. So it's not. Oh, improper. no, that's, I mean, it no, that, you're right. To be. <laughs> you're right. right. That, no, that was, that wasn't the right way to phrase that. That's right. Well, it'd be, it would be calling improperly if I called with pocket threes here or something. Right. right? Yes. Right? Yes. Yes. Yeah. But yeah, just. Or kinda... if your opponent's range only had aces, obviously yeah. it would be. Right. But you, we don't know that. Right. Mm hmm. Yeah. All right. Well, it's a. I feel like I had one more thing I want to take on that. Ugh, don't do live shows, folks. <laughs> Not when you get older. <laughs> Kim, you look like you've got something you want to. No, I just like, I just think it's a really, really a rare moment where you have a chance to become the overall chip leader by mm. far and in a tournament. And I, I'm not sure I would be able to pass up on that. Yeah. Yeah, good one to bring in. Good one to bring in. And that's why uh, uh, that's why it's good to talk about it in a group too. We had a bunch of different perspectives on this. Um, so I, I guess I should thank um, Rob and uh, Chris for posting in the forums. Does anyone else have any other thoughts on this or list? I was just going to say I I have a feeling right now sitting here. I think the best thing to do would probably be fold. In the moment, I think there's about a 75% chance I call because <laughs> I tend to overcall a little bit too much in the moment. <laughs> yep. It's, it's, that's the fun way to do it, right? I think a few of us have that issue here, to be honest with you. But um, good for you to find that discipline. Uh, that is a hard one. That is a hard one to lay down. I guess, is there any way that, is there any way that we get to feel more sure about spots like this like chris have you ever found some solace in like breaking it down afterwards and being like you know what he did have a really tight range there or something like that like does that help or is it just is it does it just it just sucks not knowing well, i did and... i did bink this tournament so that's my oh! soul <laughs> <laughs> okay nice, nice. But no I don't, I don't think i don't think so i mean like honestly if this, oriented. If, this was a, uh, if this was a um if this person had stats like a you know 28 20 for right. the 12 three i am snap calling yeah. this you know so fast yeah but i just feel like what i think the bubble does is it uh, the the aggro players get more aggro and the tighter players get tighter i think what that in my experience uh bubble play tends to amplify people's tendencies so i i just feel like when i see a tight player and they make a not tight play then my alarm bells just start firing off. Um, and then, but I don't know if I'm right. These, these aren't super tight stats. They're just like relatively tight. Just a little yeah. tighter than average There's, stats. Yeah. What would you do here if you, if villain had you covered? 
Mm -hmm. Would you call here with your queens? If you're not the chip leader, there's no, but you can't abuse anybody. Probably. You're yeah. Like, I'm, I'm yeah. probably calling because I'm yeah. also feel like uh, a chip leader is more likely to be exerting pressure with a wider range. Yeah. When somebody puts their life on the line, tournament life on the line, then I even feel a like, tight player. <laughs> yeah. Even the no, tight player. <laughs> when, when the tight player, no, no. Cause I do think people, people uh, understand uh bullying and understand um that when they can exert the hammer or the pressure they um they cannot have it sometimes and, and so then I, I have to call with queens and there's like this leveling war right a little bit because you're saying that in this case because you had this player covered they should be doing this with a very very tight range Right. And you're saying if they had you covered, you would assign them a wider range. Um, and so there's that tension with, yeah, but if <laughs> if they have me covered, I shouldn't call because I can go home, but they have a wider range. So my hands actually doing better against that range. So I should call. And also, like, uh, you know, the, the the flip side of this is when I have. 30 big blinds. I mean, I can, I, it, I shouldn't go out right now and I, I can, I shouldn't lose out on a min cash, but I, there's actually more to gain by doubling up with 30 or 35 mm. big blinds than, the, than there is for me as the third overall player in chips and the chip leader at my table. Like there's actually, there's more to gain for me in that position. So, you know, and I, I don't really care. Like, um there are some tournaments where i care about min caching but like this kind of tournament it's it's a bummer but i i'm i'm gonna try to cash i'm not gonna be crazy about it but i'm not gonna fold pocket queens like mm. let's go there's a, a great question from Stu here that says if they just raised what would you do with the queens then so let's say so about that same player uh 17 10 6 uh, you're going to be in position. You've opened to 2.2. Let's say they raise it to eight or nine or mm. eight, let's say from out of position. Um, yeah. What do you do then? This is a, it's a really interesting question. Cause I think um, we, I mean, if, if this is non bubble situation um, I'm mixing up depending on player, but against um, against this player type, I'm probably flatting with Queens and playing in position uh, against the three bet. Um, but in this spot, I'm probably, I'm raising. And mm -hmm. so if you wanted to induce me to get my whole stack in there, if you do have aces, um, a, a smaller three bet would be much more effective. And and it's, it's interesting. Sometimes I feel like we feel like the all in shove is stronger. And sometimes we feel like the, the not all in raise is stronger. And I think it really comes down to what is the person trying to do? What is the chip stack? What is the tournament structure? What's their vision of your image? Um, and then, you know, usually, as we say on the show here, usually you're just trying to do the thing that they're trying not to make you do. <laughs> it's often, if you need I a tiebreaker. <laughs> yeah, Kim. I know. I just think this is ace king offsuit. Yeah. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, it probably is. I mean, that's sixty percent of the time. Yeah, no, I think it is a lot. A lot of the time, this is ace king. Yep. Um, and that's what you see in non-bubble situations all the time. Like I call these sometimes just to kind of like, especially in the cheaper tournaments, just to see. Want to see like, yeah, what are you shoving sixty big blinds with? <laughs> and then we race, you know, because I'll, I'll I won't do it with anything, but I'll do it with nines and tens and just like let's yeah. Now, John, do you recall what the Somsky ratio of the table was um, when you were making this decision? John, you mean Chris? Oh, did I say John? Sorry. Yeah, <laughs> I was so fun. I was so damn it. I was setting it up. I was so excited about setting it up. Uh, Chris, do you recall uh, the Somsky ratio of the table at the table at this time? Uh, I don't. Okay. I don't. I don't know that I know what the, what is the Sobsky ratio. Oh, I'm sure someone. Nobody I'm sure knows. someone. I'm sure someone of your poker education knows what the Sobsky ratio. It, it it has to do with how in line the stacks at the table are. So the higher the disparity between the biggest and the smallest stack, the the higher the Sobsky ratio. 
And so it can affect some ICM situations. Oh, well, there definitely were some shorties. Um, yeah. You know, there was, uh, I think, you know, a 12 and a 15 big blind stack at our table, maybe. And then in the tournament overall, there was like a, you know, a seven or eight big blind kind of thing mm -hmm. going on. So mm -hmm. um, there's definitely people to get rid of before somebody should be putting 41 in the middle. Yeah, that's because that's another good, this is one of those very rare spots where the stacks of the players at the other tables also matters a little when you're actually on the stone cold bubble. Um, people should be kind of paying attention to that and some will get out of line more and some will get out of line less as Chris was saying. So yeah, I, I don't know anymore. I came into this thinking I had an idea and now I just know I'm a confused gentleman who enjoys playing poker. So uh, that's, that's what I got. Anything else before we uh, mosey on out of here game? Well, one, one, la I know I don't want to belabor this, but one last question. So you, what if you're in the small blind and you've got 41 mm. big blinds, mm -hmm. Are you ever shoving? And if so, what is your shoving range? Like, or are you, or are you th three betting smaller? Mm, good question. Mine's are eight plus. Eight and you're plus. shoving? You're shoving 40? Yes. Big, really? Because that's the only way to get you to fold there. Yeah. Maybe. That's true. Maybe nines plus. Yeah. yeah. I like to think I'd have the cojones to shove with with a wider range than that but i feel like i yeah i don't know i, I don't know i don't know i i want to i want to do some work on this spot myself because um this is if a situation I, if that i know i can make lot. if i know i can make queens fold and fold i'm shoving pocket right. twos plus right <laughs> yeah okay i'm shoving range yeah <laughs> i'm shoving <laughs> range <laughs> <laughs> all right good stuff well, thanks, everybody. I always enjoy these chances to get together with the crowd and talk poker. So I want to thank Running Aces Hotel, Racetrack, and Casino, Website Amp, John, Kim, Chris, and Stu, and Rob. Thanks, everybody. I'll see you again soon.